Well, hello. <laughs> this is a recorded rehearsal of a presentation done um, a couple places. Um, 2017 at the uh, International Dyslexia Association Conference and the 2019th conference for the San Diego branch of IDA and a couple of other places too. There may be some phone and cat interruptions <laughs> occasionally, so bear with me. This morning, we're going to go on a journey together to explore the question Is dyslexia a gift? Which, as it turns out, is something of a bone of contention in the dyslexia field and community. <clears throat> in case you can't see this, the scientist on the left says to the one in the hole with the bone, put that down, you fool, it's a bone of contention. The quote, fools rush in where angels fear to tread, probably also applies. And I guess that makes me the fool, but here we go. Anyway. First, though, three quick housekeeping. Details. Our objective for the next 90 minutes <clears throat> is to explore from various perspectives whether or not dyslexia is a gift. We'll work from this infographic, which was published by the International Dyslexia Association, IDA, in the fall of 2017, and which can be found on our website, dyslexiaida.org. We also have the same infographic as a hard copy handout, which looks like this, except it's black and white. It's one page, front and back, available up here if you don't have one yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's our game plan. Before we can talk about whether or not dyslexia is a gift, we need to make sure we're all on the same page about what dyslexia actually is. So I'll spend a few minutes on its definition, prevalence, and the role of genes. This will be followed by a brief overview of some of the various pros and pro con perspectives on dyslexia's relationship to giftedness. Then it will be time for you to roll up your sleeves. We'll break into pairs or triads to consider which perspectives resonate most for you. After that, we'll do a deep dive into six more perspectives and do one more pair share activity. Activity. We'll finish with a discussion about neurodiversity, cerebrodiversity, and developmental perspectives. And then I'll wrap up, possibly squeezing in one more pair share activity before our cue. So this is the journey we'll be on for the next 90 minutes. <clears throat> and I want you to know that it took me way too long to make all those silly little stick figures. Of course, once I'd invested all that time, I became pretty committed to them. So I'll start using them randomly all over the place just to amuse myself. As you can see. Anyway, since we have an ambitious agenda for a 90-minute session, let's hold questions until the Q&A at the end. But I don't want you to forget them, so please jot them down as we go. 
go. And a final note, since we'll be going really fast, you might miss some of the URLs as they fly by. If you're not, I'll bring them back during the Q&A or for anyone who wants to see them. So here we go. Fasten your seatbelt. It's going to be a speedy ride. We start with this question, what is dyslexia? Since we're exploring a possible relationship between talent and dyslexia, we need a shared reference point on this condition. Let's flesh out our understanding of dyslexia by looking at it through three lenses. <clears throat> IDA's definition of dyslexia, dyslexia's prevalence and its familial or genetic element. A show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the International Dyslexia Association's definition of dyslexia? Well, it's a bit dense, as you can see here. So let's break it down into a one-minute snapshot. We'll use a graphic organizer and some wording, both developed for a recent IDA examiner article by Emerson Dickman, a former president of IDA. So it goes like this. A neurologically based deficit in processing the phonological component of language, those are the sounds of spoken language results directly in difficulty with decoding, spelling, accuracy, and fluency. That in turn impact comprehension and reading experience. Impoverished reading experience further impacts the development of vocabulary and background knowledge. Which also have a negative influence on comprehension. And by the way, Emerson played a key role in developing IDA's formal definition too. Now notice that there's no mention of gifts in this definition. The closest we come is this wording in yellow, a deficit that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities. So, hmm. Okay, with that snapshot of IDA's definition in mind, how widespread is this condition? Some interesting statistics can give us a An idea. About 13 to 14 percent of the school population nationwide has a handicapping condition that qualifies them for special education. Half of them, 6 to 7 percent, are classified as having a learning disability, and about 85 percent of them have a primary disability in reading and language processing. So a very high percentage of students in special education services with learning dif disabilities have difficulties in reading and language processing. Up to 15 to 20 percent of the population as a whole they have some symptoms of dyslexia, including slow or inaccurate reading, poor spelling, poor writing, or mixing up similar words. Not all would qualify for special education, but most probably would benefit from systematic explicit instruction in reading and language. 
especially as young children. Now that number <clears throat> may not be as precise as we would like. It's more like an impressionistic painting, but it's enough for us to conclude that children with symptoms of dyslexia are in every classroom, and almost everyone knows someone who struggles with some symptoms of dyslexia. For example, this gentleman, the newly elected governor of California, has dyslexia. So dyslexia affects people from all walks of life, and it actually has nothing to do with intelligence one way or another. Other. And by the way, you can find this infographic too at dyslexiaida.org. So, still nothing here about dyslexia and special gifts or talents. Let's talk about dyslexia and genes. Show of hands, how many of you have dyslexia in your family? Dyslexia does have a strong familial component. It often runs in families. In fact, it's been shown that between 40 to 60 percent of children who have an older sibling or parent with dyslexia also will develop difficulties learning to read. <clears throat> Neuroimaging research also suggests that children who subsequently develop dyslexia enter school with brains less optimally organized for learning to read. In other words, this research suggests there are pre-markers for developmental dyslexia in the pre-reading and infant brain. So, some children's brains may be predisposed for dyslexia even before they enter school, even before they may have been hurt by ineffective teaching practices. That said, your genetics is not your destiny. Just because your brain or a family member's brain is not optimally organized for learning to read when you enter school, that doesn't mean you are doomed. This is because the human brain develops according to a dynamic interplay between a genetic blueprint bequeathed by natural selection and environmental experience. This brain development is facilitated by neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to alter and form new neuronal connections and to reorganize. So it's important to remember that in the words of Stanislas de Haan, the brain is a plastic organ which constantly changes and rebuilds itself and for which genes and experience share equal measure. These genetic mechanisms, environmental influences, and their neural interplay yield tiny anatomical cellular and connectional differences in our brains as unique to each of us as our fingerprints. These neural differences in turn produce subtle cognitive strengths and weaknesses that differ from person to person. And by the way, they also differ among people with dyslexia in, forms of, in terms of severity and the exact nature of their hallmark dyslexic characteristics.
This brain diversity probably is a selective biosocial advantage in human evolution, and our history suggests that our future probably will continue to depend on our species' ability to exploit individual strengths for collective success. Some of these combinations and spectrums of cognitive strengths and weaknesses include traits that make learning to read difficult. These neurologically based weaknesses are exacerbated when subjected to ineffective methods of instruction. Now, it's not surprising that some people struggle learning to read. For starters, the human brain did not evolve for the purpose of reading. In fact, our species has been illiterate far longer than we've been literate. As Stanislaus Dehaan says in another quote, brain circuitry inherited from our primate evolution is co-opted for the task of recognizing words. So. Perhaps having to repurpose neural circuitry that evolve for other functions contributes to our variability in reading acquisition. For some of us, learning to repurpose that neural circuitry for reading may be more of a challenge than for others especially since skilled reading is a very complex task. It requires fluent execution and coordination, a weaving of the many strands of skills and subskills of word recognition and text comprehension. So learning to read is not easy. In the words of John Steinbeck, some people there are who being grown, forget the horrible task of learning to read. It is perhaps the greatest single effort that the human undertakes, and he must do it as a child. Now, many of us may be predisposed to struggle with a complex task that requires us to repurpose neural circuitry that evolved for other functions. But environmental experience can play a key role alleviating the challenge. Remember, the human brain develops according to a dynamic interplay between a genetic blueprint and environmental experience. <clears throat> Scientifically based instruction, such as structured literacy, is an example of the kind of environmental experience that can help diminish, even prevent, many of the academic struggles individuals with or predisposed for dyslexia experience. As Bruce Lipton says, the idea that we are controlled by our genes is false. It's an idea that turns us into victims. The genes are merely the blueprints. We are the contractors, and we can adjust those blueprints. Which is why instruction forged in the science of reading is vital. For children to read early and successfully, they need explicit, systematic, and sequential instruction in five key components of literacy early in their schooling. Phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. All children benefit from this instruction, but it is especially vital for vulnerable learners such as those with dyslexia or economically disadvantaged children. If you want to do a deeper dive into structured literacy and reading science, please check out two additional resources 
First, IDA's Knowledge and Practice Standards for Teachers of Reading at dyslexiaida.org. Second, the excellent podcast, Hard Words, Why Aren't Our Kids Being Taught to Read at p.m. at apmreports.org. Now, although we didn't explicitly discuss whether or not dyslexia is a gift in this section, we did touch on two important concepts that will weave into the next sections, which will explicitly explore a possible relationship between dyslexia and talent. These concepts are First, the human brain develops according to a dynamic interplay between a genetic blueprint and environmental experience. And second, these neur neural differences in turn produce subtle cognitive strengths and weaknesses that differ from person to person. So with our shared reference point on dyslexia and key information about its definition, prevalence, and gene-brain-environment gene brain interplay in mind, now, informed by all of that, we're ready to dive into our overview of various perspectives on the dyslexia talent hypothesis. Let's start by touching on why the question might be important. If dyslexia and talent are somehow linked, that would have implications for how we approach screening and assessment. instruction and intervention. And guidance, especially how we might guide career choices. This talent also would be a valuable resource that might be cultivated for the collective good. With all that in mind, let's look at our infographic. So find your handout. The first panel focuses on the pros, arguments in favor of the hypothesis that dyslexia is a gift. In this panel, in the brain's right hemisphere, you can see some of dyslexia's hypothesized strengths listed. I've pulled these out on the next six slides to make them easier to read. Visual spatial talents. Holistic and big picture thinking. Seeing patterns, connections, and similarities. Creative, out-of-the-box thinking. Strong reasoning skills. And intuitive grasp of new concepts and abstract ideas. Looking again at your handout on the far left side of this panel in the brain's left hemisphere, we see some of the people and professions often associated with dyslexia. In fact, all kinds of people on the dyslexia spectrum work in all kinds of occupations, but some are thought to be especially compatible with dyslexia. For example, we have lots of dyslexia success stories in the careers on this slide. 
and many of the people on the right side of this slide say they've succeeded not in spite of their dyslexia, but because of it. Moving, <clears throat> moving to the right side of the first panel, you can see many of the arguments advancing the hypothesis that dyslexia is a gift. I've pulled those out onto slides two to make them easier to see. So for many people in a dyslexia community, the notion that dyslexia imparts cognitive advantages is a pillar for a movement that celebrates dyslexia strengths and asserts that brains of people with dyslexia are different, not defective. Dyslexiaadvantage.org and Richard Branson's madebydyslexia.org do a nice job making this case, and I recommend visiting their websites for more on this perspective. For some, the notion that dyslexia has benefits can be a lifeline of hope, lifting the spirits of parents and students, drowning in the academic challenges that typically overwhelm learners on the dyslexia spectrum. <clears throat> and as anyone who's struggled with adversity and challenge knows, hope, the promise of reaching a distant shore can make all the difference. And that's one reason why a parade of celebrity dyslexics marches through most stories in the popular press about dyslexia. So just for fun, I did an image search on dyslexia as a gift, and these are some of the images that pop up. As you can see, this perspective has become fairly mainstream. On the other hand, not everyone buys the premise that dyslexia is a gift. Here are some of the screenshots from an image search on dyslexia is not a gift. We also have respected scholars like Louisa Motes, who in a 2015 IDA conference keynote and a 2016 examiner article challenged the notion that dyslexia and giftedness go hand in hand. saying our best science indicates that dyslexia and visual spatial concept formation, problem solving, and creative abilities are disassociated. And if you work directly with children or adults with dyslexia for a while, you've probably run into this reaction at some point. Hey, if dyslexia is a gift, can I give it back? So let's return to our infographic. The second panel focuses on the cons. Arguments challenging the hypothesis that dyslexia is a gift. Some people say that portraying dyslexia as a desirable gift is a Pollyannish myth. It can be damaging when expectations of having certain super abilities aren't met. Portraying dyslexia as a gift also can lead to the kind of thinking this cartoon suggests. The thought bubble says penguins are black and white. Some old TV shows are black and white. Therefore, some penguins are old TV shows. Given all the hype about the gift of dyslexia, it's easy to arrive at a similar, seemingly logical conclusion. People with dyslexia have special talents. I don't have special talents. 
So my diagnosis must be wrong, and I'm just stupid. Some take issue with perpetuating the unrealistic idea that all or even most people with dyslexia have special talents, pointing out that dyslexia is highly variable with multiple causes and expressions, and that for every superstar with dyslexia, countless others struggle with its harsh consequences. <clears throat> Some argue that the appalling lack of identification, intervention, and accommodation, especially among low-income children, must be our single-minded focus, and that everything else pale. Others worry that emphasizing difference over disability threatens hard-fought enacted rights and service eligibility. And still others join Motes in pointing out that scientific evidence directly supporting a dyslexia talent hypothesis remains thin. Still, in the infographic second panel, but over on the brain's frontal lobes, some empirical studies do show certain visual spatial strengths and visual spatial processing differences but it remains unclear how much real world advantage they can. Confer, or if they're a cause or a consequence of reading difficulties. And by the way, some scholars do question if Einstein's really did have dyslexia. Something to keep in mind when citing or reading those ubiquitous lists of famous people with dyslexia. And that concludes some of the cons, why some people do not buy the premise that dyslexia is a gift. So, does dyslexia impart special talents or not? In this cartoon, the man says, remember, there are two sides to every argument. And the woman says, well, I've given you both. Actually, there are many sides to this debate. I've given you many of them. But this issue is much more complex and nuanced than just yes or no. So now it's time for you to roll up your sleeves to explore some of these complexities and nuances. We're ready for our first activity. Let's turn our attention to the third panel of the infographic. And your handout looks like this, except it's black and white. If you still don't have one, maybe you can. Share. Find the panel at the top of the back page. It looks like this. As you review the eight pro con viewpoints around the circle, which viewpoints resonate most strongly for you? Which ones align with your views and experiences? What's missing? or should be included. And I'm gonna take just a quick sec to read these out loud. So one, which is a pro, yes. The disability paradigm is incomplete. There are myriad examples of talent and dyslexia. Number two is no, it's con. Empirical evidence is meager. This is just an illusory correlation. 
the phenomenon of perceiving false relationships. And any talents develop as defaults since reading-related paths are blocked. Number three is a con. No, and because illiteracy and academic failure are so harmful, teaching, reading, and protecting rights and services must be the priorities. Number four is a pro. Yes, anyway, technology is making print literacy less vital, maybe moot. Number five is a con. No, and print literacy will remain a gateway for full participation in society. Six, yes, a pro, high profile success stories offer a lifelines of hope and evidence of a dyslexia talent relationship. Seven is no, a con for some upside expectations can prove disappointing, more a failure. Also for every celebrity success story, thousands struggle. And finally eight, yes, it's a pro, positive thinking can impart the will to keep striving and thus improve chances for success. So which of those pro cons resonate most strongly for you? In the next minute, circle or jot down the numbers for viewpoints that resonate most strongly for you. And if a perspective's missing, jot down placeholder notes for these thoughts. So again, circle or jot the numbers for the viewpoints that resonate and add notes for anything missing. Go ahead, do this now. You'll have 60 seconds and I'm not going to do the timing in my rehearsal. Now turn to someone nearby, preferably someone you don't know, and respectfully share your thoughts about which perspectives resonate most strongly for you or any other thoughts you may have related to the dyslexia talent hypothesis. And I will give this a couple of minutes. So pairs are best for doing this, but trios are fine. You only have two minutes off. Go ahead now, find someone with whom to share your thoughts for the next two minutes. And I'm not gonna time this. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, time to stop. If you can hear my voice, please clap three times. So forgive me for interrupting you. I know great thoughts are being shared and I bet many of the nuances and complexities are being uncovered. I hope you'll continue these conversations with family, friends, and colleagues after this. Presentation. Now, though, may I see a show of hands? How many of you discovered agreement or consensus in your pairs or trios? And how many of you found that you had somewhat different or even contradictory perspectives? And thank you, as I said, I hope you'll continue these conversations Now, time for a deep dive into six more perspectives and for another activity. Let's turn our attention to the bottom panel of the infographic and handout. This panel dives a bit more deeply into some of the complexities and presents six perspectives for you to consider. Sure. First, the famous Norman Geshwin speculated that the pattern of neural development in dyslexia may reflect a mechanism advantageous to the population as a whole since it leads to diversity and patterns of talent. Now, Geshwin isn't the only one 
who early on hypothesized that some sort of dyslexia talent link, Morgan and Orton each contributed early thinking and observations. But things didn't really take off until Geshuin, a giant in our field, began speaking and writing about dyslexia and the pathology of superiority. He inspired and influenced contributions by Margaret Rawson, Priscilla Vale, Thomas West, and Gordon Sherman. And he and they influenced everything that followed. Today, we have an explosion of websites, books, organizations, podcasts, <clears throat> videos, blogs, movies, events, curriculum, and campaigns, all focusing on talents and strengths in dyslexia. So that's why we start with Geshwin and his speculations. However, the second point is that we still lack the body of empirical research and evidence needed to categorically assert there is a dyslexia advantage. Recently, the Dyslexia Foundation convened a group of renowned experts to review the scientific research and reach a conclusion on the dyslexia talent hypothesis. Peggy McArdle moderated the session and later said this. We know there are gifted children in the world and that some of them are dyslexic. What we don't know, and to date there is no real evidence of this, is whether the dyslexia and giftedness or talent are connected or just happen to co-occur in that person. People are looking at ways to study that with good research designs and solid methods, but so far it has not been done. So unfortunately, we don't have the body of scientific evidence needed to claim that a dyslexia talent link is scientifically established. But we do have some intriguing hypotheses based on decades of observations speculations and anecdotes, and on a handful of interesting studies. <clears throat> In some situations, all that might be enough. For example, as a parent of two daughters with dyslexia, all that informed my efforts to help them value their abilities and preserve their self-esteem. But as a professional in the field, I'm uncomfortable with claims that it's a scientific fact that dyslexia is a gift. We should be clear about the distinction between hypothesis and scientifically established fact. Both are important, but they're not the same.
third. On the other hand, as Carl Sagan said in his famous quote, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The fact that we haven't conducted much research on the dyslexia talent hypothesis doesn't mean there isn't a link. We do have a handful of intriguing scientific studies on dyslexia's hypothesized strengths. Unfortunately, nothing like the mountain of research conducted on dyslexia's deficits and phonological basis. Fourth, while we don't know for sure if there is an advantage to dyslexia, we do know that every child has strengths and affinities that should be nurtured. For those with dyslexia, this may be vital. We should keep an open mind and an eye out for special talents among our students on the dyslexia spectrum. Who knows whose mind will shine light on important new pathways and opportunities. Marianne Wolf has a lovely quote about this. The single most important implication of research in dyslexia is not ensuring that we don't derail the development of a future Leonardo or Edison. It is in making sure that we do not miss the potential of any child. Not all children with dyslexia have extraordinary talents, but every one of them has a unique potential that all too often goes unrealized because we don't know how to tap it. In fact, everyone has a unique potential that often goes unrealized, right? And that brings us to our second activity, which is <clears throat> one, to jot down at least one special affinity, interest, or ability you'd like to explore or are already exploring, and to jot down two, to jot down at least one step you want to take or have recently taken to explore this affinity, interest, or ability. For example, I want to explore my interest in writing a novel. By the way, I'm halfway through my first draft, yay. One step I'm taking is to take a novel writing class, which starts next week. But it could be any affinity, interest, or ability you want to explore. Maybe you want to explore surfing, and one step you plan to take is visiting the local surf shop. Or maybe you want to explore your passion for playing the guitar, and one step you'll take is spending 30 minutes practicing every day with YouTube videos. It could be any affinity, interest, or ability you want to explore, and the one step you'll take can be big or small. So the task is twofold. One, to jot down at least one special affinity, interest, or ability you'd like to explore or are already exploring. And two, to jot down at least one step you want to take or have recently taken to explore this. There are no right or wrong answers and don't worry about spelling or writing. No one will see this except you. And by the way, it can be more than one special affinity, interest or ability, and there can be more than one step. So you have one minute to do this. Begin now. And I'm not going to attack time. I'm in my rehearsal. Now turn to someone nearby, preferably someone you don't know 
and share whatever aspects you feel comfortable sharing. Pairs are best, but trios also are fine. You'll have only two minutes, so go ahead now. Find someone with whom to share for the next two minutes. And I'm not going to time. Okay, time to stop. If you hear my voice, please clap with me three times. Please forgive me for interrupting you again. <laughs> I bet some pretty cool things are being shared. I hope you'll continue thinking about special affinities, interests, or abilities you'd like to explore or are already exploring and steps you want to take or have recently taken to do so. So now, how many of you wrote down a new special affinity, interest, or ability you'd like to explore? And how many of you wrote down a special affinity, interest, or ability you're already exploring? The aim of this activity is twofold. <clears throat> First, to underscore and extend Marianne Wolf's point, everyone, child and adult, has a unique potential that often goes unrealized. Second, at the risk of being a little touchy-feely, to foster tapping a little of that potential in our selves. And to compound that touchy-feely risk, here are two quotes to inspire all of us to explore our affinities, interests, or abilities. Never underestimate the power of dreams and the influence of the human spirit. We are all the same in this notion. The potential for greatness lives within each of us. The second quote, a goal without a plan is just a wish which is one of the reasons I had you write, jot down at least one step you want to take or have recently taken to explore your affinity, interest, or ability. Okay, onward to our fifth perspective. Fifth, there are many myths about dyslexia. So it's important to get our facts straight. What we do and don't know so far. What's an intriguing hypothesis? And what's an established scientific fact? Why is this important? Because the myths and slippery facts about dyslexia sometimes are exploited by dyslexia deniers and used to challenge dyslexia's existence casting it as education's Loch Ness Monster. The book, The Dyslexia Debate, might be viewed as a recent example, uh, though with careful study on this book, it's clear it's not as controversial as first seems, but that's another talk. In any case, we must be vigilant about the facts to be cautious about portraying a fascinating but yet to be proven hypothesis as an established scientific fact. Sixth and finally, <clears throat> the environment often determines if a learning difference is a disability or a talent. Geshwin, West, Armstrong, Sherman, and others remind us that that environmental demand usually determines which cognitive traits are assets and which are liabilities. In certain environments, certain traits can be an advantage. In others, not so much. In a typical school environment, 
dyslexic traits usually are a disadvantage. Like asking for something like this. But in other environments, certain traits can be an advantage, <clears throat> enabling great heights to be scaled. And the environment can and usually does change. Today's school model that so disadvantages people with dyslexia is a mere blink of humanity's 300,000 year old eye. Given the exponential pace of technological advancement and social change, who knows what tomorrow's schools will look like? Maybe they'll be better for students with, dyslexia, with a dyslexic cast of mind. So that wraps up our six perspectives at the bottom of the infographic in your handout. We're ready for our next agenda item, which is a double header, the cerebrodiversity and neurodiversity frameworks and the developmental perspective. These sections have some of the most challenging and esoteric material we've covered so far, but since they also weave in threads you're already familiar with from other sections, that prior knowledge should be helpful. Neurodiversity and cerebrodiversity are two really interesting theoretical frameworks that help inform our understanding of dyslexia and its possible relationship to talent. We'll start with neurodiversity. How many of you have read Thomas Armstrong's book, Neurodiversity? If not, I recommend it. <clears throat> In his book, Armstrong traces the origins of the term, which he attributes to Judy Singer, a parent of a child on the autism spectrum. The term first appeared in print in a 1998 article by Harvey Bloom for The Atlantic. He wrote, neurodiversity may be seen as every bit as crucial for the human race as biodiversity is for life in general. Armstrong goes on to explore neurodiversity in the context of seven conditions, including dyslexia, which he argues in his book are natural human variation rather than mental disorders. He emphasizes the strengths, talents, abilities, intelligences, and extraordinary gifts of neurodiverse individuals, but stresses that we shouldn't romanticize or trivialize the damage these conditions can inflict. His thesis backed by brain science, evolutionary psychology, and anthropology, is that diversity of minds in humans is good. Now I've zipped through all that, but we'll revisit and flesh out these themes as we go along. Armstrong also delineates eight principles of neurodiversity. One, the human brain works more like an ecosystem than a machine. Two, human beings and human brains exist along continuums of competence. Three, human competence is defined by the values of the culture to which you belong. Four, 
For whether you're regarded as disabled or gifted depends largely on when and where you were born. Five, success in life is based on adapting one's brain to the needs of the surrounding environment. Six, success in life also depends on modifying your surrounding environment to fit the needs of your unique brain, what Armstrong calls niche construction. Seven, niche construction includes career and lifestyle choices, assistive technologies, human resources, and other life-enhancing strategies tailored to the specific needs of a neurodiverse individual. And eight, positive niche construction directly modifies the brain, which in turn enhances its ability to adapt to the environment. Here's how the dynamic interaction, interactive process of niche construction might work in dyslexia. First, a genetic predisposition shapes the brain. which then encounters difficulties in the traditional school environment, learning, reading related skills. Which then leads to selection of activities that reinforce pre-existing neural tendencies for certain aptitudes and certain weaknesses. which then get further amplified through environmental modification and engagement that reward development of these aptitudes and discourage strengthening of these weaknesses, and so on. This is Armstrong's niche construction, which offers insights into how people with dyslexia might develop certain aptitudes or talents. onto cerebrodiversity, a term coined in 2002 by D Gordon Sherman in a series of talks. Sherman is executive director emeritus of Newgrange and Laurel Schools and the Rabinowitz Education Center, former director of the Dyslexia Research Lab at B.I. Deaconess Medical Center and a former IDA president. How many of you have heard Gordon Sherman present. If you haven't, I recommend tracking him down on Google and listening to some of his talks. Sherman sees dyslexia as a byproduct of cerebrodiversity, which he defines as humanity's collective neural heterogeneity and describes as an important adaptive advantage that enabled our species to leverage individual strengths for collective success, something we touched on earlier. Sherman's cerebrodiversity framework builds on Geshuin's speculations and with whom Sherman worked at the beginning of his own career in neuroscience. For example, Sherman's model of developmental dyslexia transcends today's disability paradigm by taking the broad view and Geshwin, whom you might recall from our earlier timeline, argued that the knowledge of every aspect of dyslexia will be enriched by seeing it in its broadest biological and sociological settings. We must understand its relationship to high talents 
and the societal setting in which it becomes a disability. So taking this broadest view, we can see that two spectacular events in human history helped create a sociological setting that disadvantaged those with a dyslexic cast of mind. One was the invention, uh, the invention of writing around 3000 BC. The other was the invention of the printing press around 1440. Both ultimately led to an environment that disadvantaged people on the dyslexia spectrum. But viewing dyslexia in its broadest biological setting imparts an even more expansive view. allowing us to see learning differences as byproducts of a complex mechanism, the dynamic gene-brain environment interplay that enabled our species to adapt and succeed for around 300,000 years. We touched on this earlier in the talk. This more expansive view gives us a broader canvas of understanding for appreciating how, sculpted by evolution's agents, diversity, environmental change, and adaptability, the human brain came to develop according to a dynamic interplay between a genetic blueprint bequeathed by natural selection and environmental experience. <clears throat> this brain development, as we discussed, is facilitated by neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to alter and form new neuronal connections and to reorganize. And as we discuss these genetic mechanisms, environmental influences, and their neural interplay, yield tiny anatomical cellular, cellular and connectional differences in our brains, as unique to each of us as our fingerprint. Which in turn produce subtle cognitive strengths and weaknesses that differ from person to person. This evolutionary perspective helps us see dyslexia and its traits and spectrums as byproducts of cerebrodiversity and highlights how gene-brain environment interaction yields neural strengths and weaknesses, which, depending on environmental demand, can translate into socially defined talents and disabilities. Sherman's evolution cerebrodiversity explanation of dyslexia draws from neuroscience, evolution, and human history to posit an explanation for the variation we see in people with dyslexia. In terms of the severity and nature of dyslexic characteristics, the comorbidities, for example, ADHD often travels with dyslexia and the paradoxical strengths and weaknesses often reported in dyslexia and other neurodevelopmental conditions. He also hypothesizes overrepresentation of corresponding talents in dyslexia, like these here, and that these talents result from the same cerebrodiversity mechanisms that produce dyslexia's hallmark difficulties learning to read, write, and spell. Finally, 
Sherman's evolution lens sharpens perspective on the transience of the environmental context defining today's learning assets and liabilities. For example, as long as print literacy remains fundamental to society, some will struggle with dyslexia, but others will be disabled by tomorrow's demands. To illustrate how quickly social environment, environmental demands can change, Sherman used to ask teachers attending his talks, how many people are discovering they have dystechnia? And nearly, since he gave his talks to people of a certain age, nearly every one's hands went up. Uh, we have a mixed audience here today, so perhaps we'll get a just different response. So let's try another approach. This question is for those in the room who are north of 45. How many of you are feeling like you are coming down with a case of dystechnia? Well, those of us who have a few decades under our belts can attest technology is quickly changing our social environment. And as the lessons of humanity's 300,000 year history suggest, our future will continue depending on, at least in part, our species' ability to exploit individual strengths for collective success. No one knows what talents or strengths will be needed to solve tomorrow's challenges, but cerebro diversity and adaptive advantage and the ultimate human resource ensures that all kinds of thinkers will be available. I think this wise little poem by my nephew when he was just seven years old makes that point better than any cognitive neuroscientist does. If everyone was the same and someone had a thought and it was wrong, then everyone would be wrong. So everyone needs to be different. Now, there's a lot of overlap in the neurodiversity and cerebrodiversity frameworks. Both posit that brain diversity may be a selective biosocial advantage in human evolution. Both remind us that the environment not only helps shape the brain, but also to some degree defines disabilities and talents. Both caution that the environment is subject to change. And finally, both suggest that many individuals with neurodevelopmental differences, such as dyslexia, often seem to have strengths relative to their weaknesses, and perhaps even talents that can enrich all our lives. Now, I do have two caveats about these frameworks. First, neurodiversity and cerebrodiversity terms and constructs should not be misconstrued. They do not supersede the terms and constructs behind today's dyslexia legislation, IDEA, or DSM-5. And should not be used to undermine identification, associated rights, or evidence-based interventions and efforts. Second, not all neurodevelopmental differences are equal in their impact. Even in optimal environments, the, the nature and severity of some learning differences translate into disabilities. However, 
Even these fall under the subtle category of human variation, and their negative impact usually can be offset at least to some degree. Those caveats aside, the value of these two frameworks is in the sweeping perspective they offer on the role neurodevelopmental variation has played in the evolution and success of our species. Okay, time to turn to the second half of our last topic, the developmental perspective. Our objective today has been to explore from various perspectives whether or not dyslexia is a gift. Toward that end, we explored a host of pro-con perspectives in favor of and against the dyslexia talent hypothesis. We also did a deep dive <clears throat> into six additional perspectives, ranging from historical research and lack thereof to potential problems with myths and the role of environment in defining abilities and disabilities. From there, we went to the neurodiversity and cerebrodiversity frameworks, which we just wrapped up. Our last perspective factors developmental time into the dynamic gene brain environment interaction. And for this, we start with my own journey as someone who was diagnosed with dyslexia. And here I am in first grade, right around the time I was diagnosed. Can you find me? I'll give you a hint. I'm in the first row. That's me, overshadowed by the girl showing off her skirts. It's hard to say exactly what was going on in her mind, but I can tell you what was going on in mind mine, at least at that time. I was very anxious and very confused, but I also was very lucky, even though I didn't know that at the time. When this picture was taken, I had just been diagnosed by Dr. Cole at Mass General Hospital. who worked with Dr. Orton. And yes, I received Orton Gillingham intervention as a youngster. Now, a lot happened between this chapter of my story and my more recent chapters, too much to cover here, but I do want to focus on two issues that my story illustrates. First, it's vital to receive the right kind of environmental experience, i.e. effective intervention at a young age, while the brain is most plastic. Now, I don't want to imply everything was copacetic from then on. I continued to struggle in various ways. But I doubt <clears throat> I'd have found my way to Harvard or even be talking to you today without some important early environmental advantages, which included what we now call structured literacy intervention. Second, when we think about dyslexia and the profiles of strengths and weaknesses and the gene-brain environment interplay, we also need to factor developmental time into this dynamic interaction. which Deborah Weber does beautifully in her book, Rethinking Learning Disability. Oops. 
How many of you have read her book? It's another one I highly recommend. Weber reminds us that skills are constructed systemically as a function of the ongoing interaction of genes, organism, and environment over developmental time. And that various neural functions not only develop in interaction with the environment, but also with one another. And that all occurs in ways that are inseparable. This developmental perspective fleshes out our understanding of the gene-brain environment interplay and dyslexia, and it probably factors into any dyslexia talent link. For example, Weber goes on to say, a developing brain may compensate for early maladaptive variations, sometimes constructing alternative pathways for accomplishing the same functional goal. Such compensation can incur a cost to the system as a whole. But maybe, and these are just my speculations, maybe along some of those alternative pathways being constructed by a, developmenting, by a developing brain, compensating for early variations and interacting systemically with its environment, maybe under the right environmental conditions and circumstances, Maybe very good things also might happen. So while it's true that we don't outgrow dyslexia, it's also true that dyslexia changes over our lifetimes, partly because environmental demands change and partly because the brain develops systemically as a function of an ongoing interaction of genes, organism, and environment over time. So one takeaway is that just because something starts out seeming impossible, with the right kind of environmental engagement can become possible. And we are now nearing the end of this talk. Time to wrap up. Let's focus on our takeaways. Over the next minute, please jot down at least three items you think are most important takeaways from today's presentation. And there are no right or wrong answers, and these notes are just for you. So don't worry about handwriting or spelling. You have one minute to do this. Begin now. And I'm not going to time during my rehearsal. Now, share your key takeaways with at least one person, preferably someone you don't know, for the next two minutes. And again... I'm not going to time this. Okay, time to stop. If you can hear my voice, please clap with me three. Three times. Forgive me for interrupting you again. This will be the last time. And I do hope you'll continue these conversations even after this. talk. But now we have a few more items to wrap up. Here's where we are on our journey exploring the dyslexia talent hypothesis. We're just about to cross the finish line. But before we move on to our q and I'd like to close with some of my own key takeaways.
viewing dyslexia through the prism of a dynamic, ongoing gene-brain environment interplay. allows us to better see the full range of dyslexia's developmental, multidimensional spectrum complexities and provides an essential foundation for considering various perspectives about the dyslexia talent link hypothesis. It helps us understand that dyslexia is a neurodevelopmental multi-dimensional spectrum condition. Its various hallmark characteristics fall along continuums of severity that aren't fixed These traits can change developmentally across the lifespan and improve with environmental influence, such as effective teaching, for example, structured literacy. Given all that, the debate about whether or not dyslexia is a gift probably is a bit of a red herring. Strongly advocating for one side or the other in this debate certainly is premature and ultimately may be misguided. Premature because no one truly knows for sure if it's a gift or not, yet anyway. Misguided because as we've been learning, dyslexia is a neurodevelopmental multidimensional spectrum condition. Whether or not a particular individual's dyslexia turns out to be a benefit depends on way too many factors and variables. A binary debate or yes-no assertions obscure many of those factors. I think we need to move this conversation to a higher level and to encourage more nuanced explorations informed by what we do know about dyslexia. Again, that it's a neurodevelopmental, multidimensional spectrum condition. So we probably need to reframe this question. <clears throat> to something along these lines. Given just the right environmental conditions and interactions, are people on the dyslexia spectrum predisposed for certain traits that might benefit those individuals and society? In any case, even though we don't know for sure whether or not there's a special benefit to dyslexia, It's worth repeating, we certainly do know that every child has strengths and affinities that should be nurtured. For those with dyslexia, this may be especially vital, and I bet that's something we all can agree on. Our time today has flown, but before we, I end, I'd like to leave those with dyslexia with a few lessons I've learned on my own journey now over six decades long, closing in on seven. Maybe some of this will be helpful to some of you on your own journey. Here we go. In most academic areas, you will need to work harder than most of your peers. 
but learning to work hard gives you an edge later in life. Don't assume that you can't get better at things that once were hard. And when you leave school, things often do get better. Be realistic about your areas of weakness, but don't allow those weaknesses to define you or become demons that dictate the course of your life. Don't spend the rest of your life running from your weaknesses or fighting them. Find something between flight or fight. Find the things in life that you love to do. They don't have to be great talents or gifts. They can be things you believe in or things you just like doing. Be sure to incorporate those things into your life. They and the people you love will sustain you during the rough patches and will enrich your life, maybe even other people's lives too. And finally, find ways to help other people with dyslexia on their journeys. But remember what you learned about how variable dyslexia is. Not everyone experiences dyslexia the same way. So be aware that your own experiences may not always apply to someone else. I believe talks should always end with a call to action, so here's mine. When you leave here today, think about ways you can learn, connect, and promote. I'll frame this call to action more specifically as three wishes. Learn as much as you can about dyslexia and related learning challenges. Connect with groups like IDA, Decoding Dyslexia, and Eye to Eye. And with apologies for this 19th century non-gender neutral language from Frederick Douglass, because it is far easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Be sure to promote and learn as much as you can about instruction forged in the science of reading, such as structured literacy. And now today's journey is done. Thank you for your kind attention and for spending the morning with me during my rehearsal of my talk. And that's the end.